evening and thank you for coming. My name is Brooke Pear and I'm the financial aid counselor for Pinellas County Schools. I work with students and families in the school district with scholarships such as the Bright Futures program as well as other financial aid opportunities. Tonight I will be discussing the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA with my colleagues Kaylee Forbes and Todd Smith. So since you've decided to tune in tonight, I am guessing that you've heard a little bit about the FAFSA and you're not sure if it's something that you should complete. I hope by the end of tonight, you will realize that the FAFSA is for you if you are a student that's going to continue school after high school or a parent of a student and you want financial assistance doing so. I want everyone to know that this presentation is being recorded tonight and will be available on our website pcsb.org forward slash FAFSA which is F-A-F-S-A. Before we begin I want Todd and Kaylee to introduce themselves. Kaylee you want to start? Yeah. Hi I'm Kaylee Forbes and I'm a school counselor and I work at Bogusiega High School. Thanks Kaylee. Now to you Todd. Yes, I'm Todd Smith, Executive Director of Financial Assistance Services at St. Petersburg College, where I oversee all campus operations and outreach as it relates to financial aid. Thanks, Todd and Kaylee, for being with me tonight. I know it is all our hope that we um, share information with parents, students, and families so that you are ready for the financial aid process for the class of 2021. So let's get started. First off, I'm going to cover some general information about the FAFSA, who should complete it, and the general requirements. As we go through the presentation, please submit your questions and we'll get to those at the end. So the free application for federal student aid. What is the FAFSA? It is the form you need to complete in, to get any financial assistance from the federal government to help pay for college. Submitting a FAFSA is the most important thing you can do for financial aid. It must be completed annually and opens October 1st of each year. To ensure them that you get as much money as possible, you should complete it as soon as you can once it opens. Additionally, you'll want to check with your school you plan to attend to find out their priority deadline. The FAFSA is free and getting assistance completing the FAFSA should also be free. So. We're going to talk to you tonight and at the end give you some resources of where you can get additional assistance if you need it. By completing the FAFSA, you will be eligible to get grants, work study, and student loans. Additionally, some colleges and state-based grants and scholarships also require the FAFSA. When you're ready, you will go to fafsa.gov. So who should complete the FAFSA? Essentially, as I said, anyone who's planning to continue their education after high school, and that's whether it's a community college, a technical education program such as Pinellas Technical College, a trade school, a state college such as St. Pete College, or a university such as USF. There are some general eligibility requirements that I will go over. The student must be a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen and have a so social security number. Please note that this only applies to the student. The student must have a high school diploma or equivalency, such as a GED. They must be enroll in a degree or certificate program that's eligible. There are, so there are some programs that are, are not eligible for financial aid and you'd want to talk to, with the institution you plan to attend to find out if, if you're in an eligible program. Um, males must be registered with the Selective Service if they are over 18. If when you complete the FAFSA, if you meet that category and you haven't um, registered, they will be able to do so as part of the form. Um, if the student has a drug conviction, it may affect their eligibility. So I hope that gives you an idea of what the FAFSA is. And now I'm going to turn things over to Kaylee, who's going to cover some of the specific information you will need to complete the FAFSA. Kaylee? Thanks, Brooke. So Brooke reviewed the eligibility uh, for students, and so the next factor to consider is whose information has to be used when completing the FAFSA. Um, students most of the time are gonna be classified as dependent upon their parents, um, but there are some questions that you'll answer when completing the FAFSA that will determine the status of the student. Um, and again, if you're a dependent student, this means that you would report your parents' information when you're completing the FAFSA. 
in some cases, um, and there are exceptions where a student could be classified as an independent student. And in these situations, um, and we'll go through those shortly, a student would not need to list parent or guardian information uh, for the FAFSA. So different scenarios in which a student would be classified as an independent student. Um, one, if a student happened to be married, um, they would not list parent information. Um, should a student have a child of their own and that student provides um, more than 50% of that child's financial support, they would not need to list parent information and they would be classified as an independent student. Um, if a student has already enlisted or contracted um, with a military branch um, as an enlisted student, they would not need to list parent information. Um, students are classified independent if since the age of 13 they were ever in foster care or a ward of the court or if both biological parents are deceased. Um, so in most cases you would have a letter indicating um, your eligibility as a ward of the court or a foster child um, if you were an independent student. Um, also another scenario is if a student was an emancipated minor from their parents, they would not need to list their parent information. And um, perhaps the most common scenario in which um, a student in the class of 2021 would be classified as an independent student is if they were defined as an unaccompanied youth who was homeless or self-supporting at risk of being homeless. Um, so this is a scenario that if you are um, in that situation, hopefully you've spoken with your school counselor and they've done a heat referral. And in those situations, if you are homeless, um, you or your family or independently self-supporting yourself, um, you would be an independent student and parent information would not be supplied when doing the FAFSA. So um, Brooke alluded to some of the things that you would need when you were completing the FAFSA. Again, we want to reiterate that the student must have a social security number or alien registration number. Um, parents are not required to have social security numbers in order to do the FAFSA. However, if they have it, they do need to provide it when applying for financial aid. Um, in the event that a parent is a non-citizen, um, they can still complete the parent section of the FAFSA and they would just list all zeros in the section where it's asking for the parent's social security numbers. Um, other information that would be needed regardless of a parent's status is you would need to have the student and parents W-2s and 1040s, um, their tax returns, um, as well as documentation of other income that they've earned, um, bank statements to indicate their um, investment records, um, records of untaxed income perhaps that um, the student or parent have as well. Um, and then another thing that you will need to complete the FAFSA is an FSAID. This would be one created for the student and one created for the parent. So the FSAID, what is that? In short, the FSA ID is a username and password that you are creating unique for you as the student, and then at least one parent will create one for themselves, unique for them. And this is an electronic signature that you are creating in order to be able to complete the FAFSA or electronically apply for and submit student loans, um, as well as managing student loans after completion um, from college as well. Um, it's really important that when you create this FSA ID that you are actually creating your own account. Nobody should be creating this on your behalf and you want to make sure that you're putting that in a secure place because as I mentioned you will use this for the duration of college to manage your student loans post-graduation and it's something that you would even use um, for yourself or other children perhaps like as a parent if you had more than one child going to college. So it is important that you have that in a secure place. Part of the process when creating that FSA ID, um, you have to have obviously your name and your birthday, your social security number for the student. You have to have a valid email and mailing address and a phone number. Um, again, if you are a non-citizen parent, you would not be able to complete this step, but you would still be able to submit the FAFSA um, later on. But the student should at least create their FSA ID with their name, birthday, social security, email, phone number, and appropriate mailing address. Once they create that account, um, they will also have to answer some challenge questions um, and uh, set up some security with that. 
and then they verify the information. You'll receive a six-digit text to the cell phone you provided, as well as a six-digit email um, verification. And once you have verified both the phone number and the email, you're able to use this FSA ID to electronically complete and sign your FAFSA. Um, earlier, I had mentioned that parents, if you're a non-citizen, aren't able to complete this FSA ID. However, once you complete the FAFSA with your student, again, the parent non-citizen would list all zeros on their social security number. And when you get to the end of the FAFSA, when it's asking for the signatures, there is an option to print a signature page, and you would mail that into the Department of Education for the parent's signature in lieu of an FSA ID. So um, the most common questions we get and the part that can perhaps sometimes be the most confusing is whose information do you list um, for the parent? Who is determined and classified as a parent? Um, trying to simplify it as much as we can, you're going to list the information for the legal parent or parents that you live with. So for example, if you live with both legal, biological, or adopted parents and they're married, you would list both of their information. Um, if you live with a legal parent and their spouse, you would list um, both your legal parent and their spouse's information because you're listing it for the legal parent and anyone that you live with. Um, you would list the information for legal parents, even if they're not married, if they are both living together. Now, in a situation where perhaps it's a divorced household or the um, family has never been married and they live separately, and you're not certain whose information to use, um, that's perhaps the scenarios where students become most confused. In those situations, you're gonna list the parent that you live with the most during the school year. Um, and sometimes students say, well, I do literally split my time. I rotate night to night uh, between my parents' home. If that's the case, you're going to list the parent who has primary custody according to court documents. Um, and if neither of those scenarios um, supply, you don't have a parent that you live with more than the other, or you don't have legal documents indicating a primary parent of custody, um, then you would go with the parent who provides the most financial support. And often that's going to be the individual um, paying child support. Uh, the most common question we get when it comes to this is does it matter who claims you on the taxes? And that doesn't matter as much because in divorce decrees it can rotate year to year who gets the ability to claim you. So it really matters most who you live with the most during the year, who has primary custody of you, and or which uh, parent provides the most financial support to that child. Um, and then probably the last key thing um, that causes a lot of confusion is making sure that you understand, aside from your legal, biological, or adopted parents, you never in any situation or circumstance would list information for any other guardians or grandparents or other individuals that perhaps you live with. Um, the only parent information that should ever be supplied are for your actual legal or adopted parents. Um, but guardians, again, um, grandparents or aunt and uncles or any other adult figure with whom you live with, even if they're a parent figure to you, you do not list their information on the FAFSA. Thanks, Kaylee. Before we get to the questions from our audience, Todd, can you highlight the different types of financial aid as well as talk about some scams that parents and students need to avoid? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to break down the, um, the types of uh, financial aid by categories. And um, those categories are, first and foremost, what we call gift aid or referred to as gift aid. And that's basically our free money. And that falls into types of scholarships and grants. Scholarships, as most of you know, are based on some sort of uh, merit, if you will, either um, grades, a special talent, or something along those lines. Scholarships can also be a combination of talent and um, academics and also need. Um, grants, for the most part, are based on need, and that's why it is very important for you to um, complete the FAFSA because that's the mechanism that is quite often used or most often used to determine a family's financial need. The next form or the next category of financial aid is considered what we call self-help funds. And that's federal work study programs as well as student loans. Federal work study programs, although it's something, it's a part-time job that you can get on campus, the funding for that program is provided by the federal government. Same thing with student loans. Even though it's money that you're gonna have to borrow and pay back, those funds are still being provided by the federal government. 
So again, to go back to it, it's two categories, self-help funds and gift aid. Our gift aid consists of grants and scholarships. Self-help funds consist of federal work study and student loans. And the second question um, um, you wanted to address also too, I believe, Brooke, was um, what are some things that people should um, look out for when they are in the process of applying for financial aid? Well, the first thing I'd like to say is this, again, especially as far as the FAFSA is concerned, it's called the free application for federal student aid for a reason. It's free. So again, there are companies out there that will help you and your family complete the FAFSA for a charge, but there's no need to do that. That's why it's very important to go to FAFSA, F F. F-A-F-S-A dot gov, not F-A-F-S-A dot com. Dot com would definitely get it done for you, but there will be a charge for it. As it relates to scholarships, I have three rules, and these are things that you should definitely remember. First and foremost is don't pay. Don't provide any personal information, such as social security number, date of birth, or anything along those lines. And then the last thing is don't panic. Okay, there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of options for scholarships, whether you are an incoming freshman or if you don't qualify for anything as a freshman, once you get on campus and at the institution of your choice, there will still be plenty of opportunities throughout your undergraduate uh, degree endeavors to qualify and to apply for the scholarships that might be made available and also some institutional grants as well. Great. Thank you so much. So I do know this is a lot of information that we're covering tonight, so I'm going to get to questions, but I just want to remind everyone that this is being recorded and the material will be available on our website, pcsb.org forward slash F-A-F-S-A. So we do have some questions coming in. Um, I'm going to start this first one, and, and Kaylee, since you've covered some of the information about parents on the FAFSA, I'm going to take this to you. I'm a recently married I am recently married and my husband has a senior at Pinellas Park High School. Our joint income is much higher than my husband's alone. Can we use both incomes for the FAFSA? Um, if you are married, um, what I understood is that your husband has a child at Pinellas Park High School and you're now married. You would actually list both your income as well as your spouse's income when completing the FAFSA, because um, that is required. Um, and then I might, I would just throw out there, sometimes people say, oh, our income's gonna be too high now. Everyone should do the FAFSA um, every year um, because while it's used to determine federal financial aid that you could be um, eligible for, it also can determine some state financial aid that you um, or he may be able to receive, the student. Um, but lastly, the colleges that you're applying to, you list them to receive your FAFSA. And they're using that information to also determine grant um, and need-based aid that they could award you as well. So if you choose not to do a FAFSA, we, um, colleges, they call you a non-filer. And if you choose not to do a FAFSA, you are in essence saying to those colleges that he's applying to that you can just write a check and outright cover the cost of schooling. And you would not have an opportunity for student loans or anything along those lines as well. So an answer to your question, if you are married, then um, the, the home that the student lives in, both his father and your income would be listed. And I would encourage you to make sure you still do the FAFSA. Thanks. Okay, Todd, I'm going to send this one to you. I have a bankruptcy from four years ago. How will this affect my, affect my FAFSA ability to get a loan? So it seems like Todd's having some technical difficulties. So I'll jump in on that one because we're not hearing his audio. Um, so I'm assuming if it's a bankruptcy, then we're referencing a parent that has that information. Um, the FAFSA is based upon the student's eligibility. That means that the student could still receive their student loan eligibility um, without any issues. Now, when you apply and do the FAFSA, a parent could choose to apply for a loan called a Parent PLUS loan, or you could look to do an alternative loan, a private loan. In those scenarios, those loans are credit-based, um, so that bankruptcy could have impact on your 
ability as a parent to take out a student loan to help that student pay for college. However, the student loans, when a student applies to um, a college and submits their FAFSA, those loans are not credit-based. They are actually entitlements. So as long as they are enrolled at the college, have completed their FAFSA, um, they have an entitlement to those student loans, but they are based upon the number of hours the student enrolls. So they have to at least be full-time to get the full eligibility of their student loans. Otherwise, they can prorate. So hopefully that answered that question. Thank you. Thanks for stepping in. I think we do have Todd back. So I'm going to... Can uh, you hear me now? Uh, yep, we can. So I'm going to send this okay, next great. question to you, Todd, because um, it, it definitely is one you can talk to. Uh, my income changed dramatically this year due to COVID. How will this affect my students' FAFSA if, if we're using the 2019 income? So when they had more money, now it's changed. Is there any way they can um, have that adjusted? Yes, it is. We have what you call professional judgment, or what we also like to call is changing circumstances. Uh, we can consider either any uh, significant reductions of income in a student or a parent's um, income. However, when you do the initial FAFSA, you will need to use the base year's income, which for 21-22 will be 2019. And once you get that process, then the institution in which you will be attending you will need to reach out to them to see what their process is to go through and um, allow you, you to be viewed based on the more updated information that would give a truer picture of your financial situation. Thanks, Todd. So I think that's important to, to keep in mind. You do need to complete the FAFSA with that 2019 information. So I, I, I sometimes get students who say, well, I, I need to talk to someone. I don't want to fin fill this out because it's not going to be accurate. But get it completed and then and then talk to the institution. Mm -hmm. So um, that is correct. Our next question, um, I'll see if Kaylee is, is um, how does call, how, excuse me, how does dual enrollment affect my students at FAFSA? Is, are they still eligible if they're in dual enrollment? Um, so I assume you mean they, once they graduate from high school, what impact would dual enrollment have on their financial aid eligibility? Um, the main thing is that in order to be eligible for financial aid, you have what's called satisfactory academic progress. So if your student failed their dual enrollment classes or did not do well in their dual enrollment classes, it could be a scenario where they're not eligible for financial aid because on the college side of things, they are not maintaining satisfactory academic progress. However, I'm gonna make a positive assumption that your student did incredibly well in their dual enrollment classes, they've earned their credits, and hopefully um, you know, they have you know, a decent GPA, right? But if they've earned those college credits, it actually can be to their favor because through time, a student's student loan eligibility increases incrementally based upon how many hours they earn at the college. So um, in short, a first time freshman, and I'm, I'm giving you figures that aren't exact, so I wanna make sure to say that, but let's say a first time freshman's eligibility is $5,500 a year for student loan. By the time they got to their junior year, that student's loan eligibility could increase to 6,500 because they've earned so many hours. Um, so the student loan eligibility does increase based upon the number of hours a student earns in school. Um, but it is important to note that each year a student does have to maintain satisfactory academic progress to continue to receive financial aid for that dual enrollment student. Hopefully they did well and earned the credits, but in the off chance they didn't do well and didn't earn those college credits, that poor satisfactory academic progress could impede their ability to get financial aid that first semester. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I think I cover this. I'll go over this one. When should high school seniors apply for the FAFSA? So the FAFSA opens October 1st each year, and the students should complete that as soon as they can. So um, if they had, if they were, if you were ready on October 1st, obviously we're you know, we're past that. But if you were ready, then that would be the time. There are um, different financial aid opportunities that are kind of a first come first serve so that is why we recommend that um, you should also check though with the college or um, institution that you plan to attend to find out what their priority deadline so there are a lot of deadlines out there when it comes to completing the FAFSA and um, the the one as I said first first and foremost just get it done as soon as you can but also I would recommend checking for that priority deadline with the college mm -hmm. 
And Brooke, I piggyback on that to just say that a lot of students think that they have to wait till they're admitted to a particular institution before doing the free application for federal student aid, but they do not have to, and I don't recommend waiting. If you already have an idea um, of some options or alternatives that you want to go to, you can list up to 10 options on your free application for federal student aid. So list every institution that you're interested in going to, so at least they will have your financial aid um, information when you do get admitted to that institution. Great point. Okay, um, so Kaylee, how frequently do you need to apply for the FAFSA? Um, as we indicated earlier, the FAFSA is something that you would actually do every year that your student is in school. Um, so October 1st of every year, all the way through, hopefully they continue on with grad school, et cetera. Um, as soon as that window opens in October, you would do that renewal FAFSA. And that is um, absolutely essential to make sure that you're renewing that each year. Um, and just reiterating that, the reason you wanna do that is while some things are an entitlement, you're gonna get it regardless of when you finish your FAFSA, there are some grants um, that um, it's once those funds are depleted, they're gone. And that's why the sooner you do the FAFSA, the more opportunity you have to be awarded maximum scholarship and grants. Okay, thanks so much. So um, Todd, I will uh, ask you to respond. My student lives with a grandparent just to finish their senior year. Their parents live in different places. The student is 18. Do they need to list their parents' income? That's <laughs> yes, they will need to leave at least one of their parents' income if the parents are not together. If the parents are together, wherever they may be, then they will need to live, list the income of both parents. Just because they're living with the grandmother, that does not exclude or preclude them from having to include the income of their parents. And I'm going to piggyback on that one because that's one of the unusual um, exceptions, right? I would say that student mm -hmm. really should talk to their school counselor um, because if it's a situation where for safety or for finding that that child would be um, otherwise classified as homeless, they might meet the definition of a HEAT student. Um, and so... Um, a HEAT student is, is a student that's classified as homeless if they are not living under the roof of their parents um, and they meet certain definitions as to why maybe they're living with the grandmother, mm -hmm. they might meet that definition. So it's kind of hard because there are some gray scenarios. If it's just because the parent got a new job and they moved out of state and they wanted him to finish the senior year here, then yes. That's a scenario where you're listing the parents' information. It doesn't matter they live with grandma. But if there's something else going on and it's not as black and white as that, I would say that student and that's asking that question or that counselor, um, you can always email Brooke Pear or myself, and we can help you know if that's something that you should look into heat referral for that student. All right. Thank you. Um, so... Kaylee, I'm going to go back to you with this one because it is something that you, I think you covered um, earlier, but I, we might just want to reiterate. How does a student with divorced parents list their income? Do they pick one household? Um, so we did go over that in the presentation. Um, if you are coming from a divorced household, you would list the parent with whom you live with the majority of the time. Um, and typically that's, you know, pretty, there's a primary parent and home of custody. And then perhaps maybe you, you know, every other weekend are going to another parent. You would list the parent with whom you live with um, the majority of the time. If you're in a scenario where you're literally every other day rotating um homes and you feel like it's equally and that's the way it's written out and everything, um, then you would look in your divorce documents to see if there's a primary parent for custody, um, if it's listed as a primary parent. And then the latter of that would be the parent that supplies 51% um, or more. So whichever parent is financially supporting that student more is whose information would be listed. Okay, thank you. Um, Todd, I will, I will ask you to respond to this question. My son is not a U.S. citizen, but has a Social Security number and work authorization card, which he renews every two years. Can he apply for the FAFSA? Can he get a loan? Uh, no, he would have to be a U.S. citizen or, you know, um, have a green card, but um, just having a work Permit is not enough to qualify for general financial aid requirements, even though he does have a social security number. Okay. Thanks, Todd. And um, Kaylee, I will send this one to you. My child lives alone. Can she file her own FAFSA? 
Um, so that's a situation if the child is living alone, I would make sure to reach out to the school again and make sure heat referral is done because they may very well meet the definition of an unaccompanied minor um, and could meet that um, classification as a homeless student for whatever reason that is. So there's a screening process uh, for the heat uh, referral. And if they did meet that definition, then they would be able to do the FAFSA without the parent information. But there is a verification process for that heat referral. Thanks. Um, I'm going to answer this next one. Um, which tax return do you submit when filing, filling out the FAFSA? So if you are, if you are complete, if you're a senior and you're completing the 21-22 FAFSA, you're going to be using your 2019 information. So it depends on, on the year that, um, which FAFSA you're completing, but if you're doing the one for the next school year starting the, um, next year, then you're going to be using your 2019 taxes. Um, Okay, um, Todd, we as parents filled out our part of the FAFSA. When our student went to fill out his part, it's taking us through the same questions. Why is that? Because when you do the FAFSA, it looks at the, um, the income and the resources of the household in general. So it's going to ask the same income information of the student that it would ask of the parent because it's going to include both. So if you have a student that is working and earning income, they're going to request that same information just like they would of the parents. And I hope I'm understanding that question correctly. Sometimes I have parents that create a FAFSA and put in the parent information, and then they think the student goes in and creates a FAFSA and puts in their student information. So to be clear, the student is the one that's applying for financial aid. The student will log in with their FSA ID. It'll ask all the students' personal information, and then it will ask the student their parent information. It'll ask then the student to supply parent tax information. After the parent tax information, it then asks for the student tax information. So it's all built in. I want to make sure we're clear on one application. It's not a process where you can go in, create one FAFSA, and your child go in and do a FAFSA, and they merge together. So it's one application, and which the student would log in with their FSA ID. They're supplying their personal information, the schools they hope to apply to. They'll then have information where they're prompted to answer questions about their parents. They'll supply their parents' tax information on their application. And then the final step of that FAFSA application is for the student to supply their financial information. So hopefully it's not a scenario like that. Great. Um, if there is a letter next to the number of the EFC provided by the FAFSA, example 17C, what does this mean? I'll let either of you respond if you know. 17C? I was going to have to defer to have you to, on that too. I don't know if maybe there's no. oftentimes an asterisk that you will see next to an EFC, like a little star. I don't know that I've ever seen a letter um, next to the EFC, but if you see a little yeah, star next to an EFC, that's a reflection that that student's FAFSA was selected for a process called verification, which we didn't cover in our presentation tonight. But once you complete the FAFSA, um, the Department of um, Education doesn't actually verify the information. When you submit the FAFSA, the Department of Education then submits the FAFSA to the colleges that were listed. And if you were selected for verification, each one of those colleges would be in contact with a student for information that you would have to supply to them for them to verify the information that was listed on the FAFSA. Um, and you can't receive financial aid until that verification process has been completed. So um, if you do see an EFC with a little asterisk next to it, a little star, that's reflected that that student was selected for verification. But, and I apologize, because I've never in all of my years seen a letter, so I defer to you, Todd, if you've seen a letter next to an EFC. No, I haven't. I've been in the business for almost 25 years or more. So what I would say, if that is something that you have, or you can get a screenshot of it and get it to Brooke or one of the other. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Webinar, please, yeah, please get that to me, and I'll take a look and uh, research it for you. But that is a first for me as well. So, yes, if you've submitted that question, um, when you go to our website, um, the, the FAFSA website I mentioned before, you'll be able to, in that little blue section is a button that you can 
submit a question or request an appointment. So if, you, if you'll follow through with that, then we will um, work with you to get your answer. So this is what you'll get, a little screen like this, and you can tell us what, what you're needing, and we'll, we'll get back to you on that because you've got us all stumped. <laughs> so um, can an undocumented parent apply for a loan for their student? Kaylee, you want to? Um, so an undocumented parent, unfortunately, would not be eligible to apply for a Parent PLUS loan through the Department of Education. Um, there may be some alternative loans or private loans that they could inquire um, through their banks. Um, I would imagine in most of those scenarios, they would require a co-signer or someone else that would be willing to co-sign on the loan. Um, but private loans, there may be options, but the parent would not be able to apply for a Parent PLUS loan. Um, but again, I would reiterate that the student could receive their student loans as long as they, you know, are an eligible citizen uh, with a social security number, they would automatically be entitled to those student loans. Yes, and, and the student doesn't have to have a, a credit history or credit check to do that. Right, so. and Todd, let me ask you a follow-up question, maybe. Um, so do you know if colleges, um, when it is an undocumented scenario, does that student then have additional eligibility for unsubsidized loan? No, not necessarily. Um, the only potential for additional unsubsidized loan is if it's a situation where the parents um, refuse to put any information or complete the FAFSA. And again, there's a process that you have to go through for that, but that's the only option where a student could potentially get additional unsubsidized loan. And if the and, and, I, and, and let me go back, there's a there's another option is if the parent applies for a plus loan but gets denied the PLUS loan, then those students can get additional unsubsidized. But that's the only way that additional unsubsidized loan can be offered to um, a dependent student. So I would, in that case, make sure they talk to the, the college because, as he indicated, if a parent refuses or is unable, there, there may be an option where at least the student could have additional unsubsidized eligibility. Yeah, great idea. So um, what is the maximum income you, this is one we get a lot, what is the maximum income you can have and still be eligible for financial aid? So I, I, I know this is one that we often get asked and I will kind of give my, a short answer and if everybody, anyone wants to chime in, feel free. Um, there is not a specific maximum number because there is so much that goes into to determining um, eligibility. It's the size of the, the family, the household, and how many students are, family members are in college and things. So well, there really is not um, a, to my knowledge, a, this is this is the number that you, if you have this, you can't, you're not eligible for anything. Does anyone want to add to that? So I would say also it's going to vary by where you go because um, while there's federal aid that's determined, first off, remember student loans are a form of financial aid. So it doesn't matter what your income is, as long as you do the FAFSA, the student's going to be eligible uh, for their student loan eligibility if you did the FAFSA. Um, but the other factor that plays into it is actually the cost of attendance at the college in which your child is looking to enroll. So for example, if you know um, you have um, um, uh, a significant income and your child were at St. Pete College and you weren't eligible for, say, federal Pell Grants, they would have their student loan eligibility and you may not want that and could just pay outright. However, um, if your child were looking at a private school whose tuition was, you know, upward of $60,000 a year, um, you may not necessarily be eligible for federal monies, but that college can use that gap um, between what your expected family contribution or your EFC, which is used to determine your financial aid eligibility, and they kind of look at the cost of attendance at that school, and there may be need aid that they can award you. Sometimes it's federal aid, but it's based upon unmet need. Um, that's not an entitlement like a, um, Oh, we'll just leave it at that. So it can vary by school that they could award you additional aid based upon their cost of attendance. And so there's a lot of, the, of things that play into it. But in short, as long as you do the FAFSA, every student is il eligible for financial aid, even if it's only the student loan. So I think, I think this is the theme of the evening. Everybody needs to complete the FAFSA. So, um, okay, this is about family investments regarding the net worth of your parents businesses and or investment farms does that include the value of s corporations i'll let that well okay. first of all in regards to the businesses and the farm if you don't have employees 100 employees or more you don't have to include the value of your business or your farm so that's number one 
um, as relates to other assets and things that they may have. Again, it depends on how you answer some other questions in regards to your income and things of that nature, because again, there's everybody doesn't have to answer the same questions. And so there are different formulas and algorithms that uh, make up the free application for federal student aid that may require some families to put asset information and may not require others to put asset or include asset information. But specifically as it relates to businesses and the uh, values of farms, again, if you have less than 100 employees that are, that are being employed by the business or farm, you do not have to include the value of the business or your farm. Um, does the FAFSA process change for students over 18? I'll go ahead and answer that. The process is actually the same regardless of the age of the student, um, all the way even through graduate school and beyond. So the process is the same. The only variable that can change is whether or not a student is classified as dependent or independent. Um, and again, for our students, it doesn't matter their age, um, they are classified in most cases as a dependent student um, because they're you know, a child and live in your home. So independent status, again, once they're over the age of 24, they're married, they have a child of their own, they've earned a bachelor's degree, um, there are certain qualifying things or they're a homeless student, that would then switch them to an independent status. So in most cases, you are supplying your information um, with your child as long all the way through their undergraduate degree um, unless they you know like I said get married or enlisted but it's up until the age of 24 typically you'll be supplying your information with your child thanks yeah I think that one becomes... other thing I would add to Brooke sure, sure. Um, is again kind of piggybacking on what she just said earlier is this Age would not play a role, but your your status as far as you know your education is concerned would play a role. It won't necessarily change the process. However, once you become a graduate student, then pretty much all grants are no longer available for you. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you're going to have available from the standpoint of federal financial aid and most state financial aid are going to be loans, scholarships, or those types of um, forms of aid. But grants from the federal level and the state level cease once you get your first undergraduate degree or first bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. Not the process, but what you are available for will change once you move and become a graduate student. Thanks, thanks for um, pointing that out. Yeah, so I do think that comes up a lot because students say, well, I'm 18, I'm an adult, so now I don't need to use my parent information, but, but as we've reiterated, that is, that's um, typically not going to be the case. So this is about parents' assets. Um, should cars and prepaid college be included? Todd, you want to take that? Cars, no. Cars, no, but prepaid college, yes. Okay, okay. Um, once the FAFSA has been submitted, do we need to apply for specific grants, scholarships, et cetera? Um, I will, I'll talk about that a little bit. So um, some of those are going to be um, no, you're not going to, but there are some state um, grants and scholarships that there will be a, an additional process. So if you, if you go to the state website, they have a, a list of different grants and scholarships, and you can look on each of those and it will tell you what the requirements are. If it's, it's, it will, might say it's the FAFSA, it might say it's the FAFSA, as well as um, another f application called the Florida financial aid application. Um, it might say that you need to go to the college and find out more specifics about the what you need to do to apply. So it, it, it's kind of dependent on, on which one. There's some that the FAFSA is all you're going to need to do, but there's go, there are some that will require additional steps. Anyone so, want to add? I'll go ahead and just throw out that um, I tell my students and my families, every senior should do the FAFSA. It doesn't matter what your financial scenario is. Every senior should do the Florida financial aid application. You have to do that in order to receive bright futures. There are Florida access grants if you're going to private school to help offset the cost of schooling there. Um, there are Hispanic funds and scholarships that are awarded through that program. So in addition to the FAFSA, which I explain as federal money, you should also do the Florida financial aid application, which is money from the state. The other application I tell every student and family that they should complete for their senior is the Pinellas Education um, Traditional Senior 
filing your scholarship application. That application's open right now and closes in January. That application is one application. Yes, there's an essay, and most kids stop there because of that, but it's one application, hundreds of scholarships connected to it, and those scholarships are exclusively for students in Pinellas County. So regardless of the fact that you've done the FAFSA, absolutely, you should pursue all other grants and scholarships that you can receive. So three things to make sure your child absolutely does, that FAFSA, the Florida Financial Aid application, and the Pinellas Education um, traditional scholarship application as well. And there's others, but those three absolutely make sure they do. Okay, definitely a great, good idea. So um, FAFSA asked for a savings Brooke. account. Yes. If I may, um, I want to kind of go back to the question before in regards to assets. Uh -huh. One of the things that I did want to mention, um, because we do get this mistake quite often, um, another asset that you should not, or two other assets that you should not include when asking that question is the value of your primary home or primary residence. You don't need to include that, nor do you need to include the value of any of your um, retirement um, accounts or anything like that. So just want to make sure that is understood as well. Very good point. And since we're, we're talking about the financial part, there's a couple questions that I'll um, maybe ask back to back. Um, does inherited money need to be included on the FAFSA? And how does prepaid college affect the financial aid? You want to go with that, Todd? Yes, if that inherited money, if that inherited money is in an account somewhere, then yes, you may have to include that as part of the assets because the assets again wants to know any kind of investments, what you have in checking, what you have in savings, and you know along those lines. But again, it skip trace. So again, some students and families may have to answer that question. Some students and families may not. If you are asked that question and you have that amount of money sitting up in some kind of investment or savings plan, then yes you would have to include that inheritance for fast for purposes. Yes, you would. Okay. And what was the other uh, book? There was one other one you yes. asked as well. How, how do you oh, yeah, it's prepaid. prepaid? Prepaid prepaid will work the same. Yes, yeah, whatever the value is or what you have saved up and set aside for that, and typically is in the parent's um, name. The parents will put that information into their asset information mm -hmm. on the FAFSA as well. But like I said, again, some parents have to complete their asset information. Some families do not. Thanks. And just to clarify with the prepaid, um, so that is how much the parent put towards a prepaid, not how much it's actually worth. Is that correct? It's the, I, think it's the, it's, I think it's the value that whatever state or whatever entity you have that established with, it is the value of that. So in essence, it's the cash value, to clarify, mm -hmm. that the, the family mm -hmm. could withdraw because yes. the child could go out of state. Mm -hmm. So it's the cash value that they have into that plan that they would okay. report. I just wanted to make sure that's what I... Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yes. So the, and um, I think I, this, this one I think we've kind of answered. So um, before, um, the FAFSA asked for savings account balance as of today. What if something happens to significantly impact our finances after we submitted the FAFSA. I think this would be that professional judgment that we spoke about earlier where you would still complete the FAFSA with information as of right then and then you would check with the institution and say um, with their financial aid office and explain why this is not reflective of where you're at now. So if anyone wants to that add. That's correct, Brooke. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Kaylee, I started the FAFSA as a parent. I believe my son should have completed it. Can he start a new one since I did not m complete my initial application? You actually would have to start a new one regardless because basically if you started the FAFSA, then you were applying for financial aid for yourself to go to school. So your son would have to start the application. Um, he would create his FSA username and uh, password. He would log in and start the application. He would be answering the questions as a student with all of his personal information. And then under the parent section is where your information would be listed. Once you get to the end, It'll require the student signature, which would be his FSA ID, username, and password. And then you would sign under the parent section with your username and password, all on his application. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so one, one question that I've been asked to 
to just um, emphasize again, which are the three essential applications that Kaylee mentioned earlier that, that all we recommend all seniors complete. That is, of course, the FAFSA that we're talking about tonight. The other is the, free, the Florida Financial Aid application, the FFAA, um, sometimes referred to as the Bright Futures application because it is required for that. And the third is the Pinellas um, Foundation, Pinellas Foundation Traditional Senior Scholarship application. All three of those are currently open and available for students to complete. And um, it is when if you go to so that we have the, the FAFSA page and I also have a regular financial aid page. So pcsb.org forward slash financial aid will take you there and you will find links to to all three of those there. So that's that's another place to check. And I would reiterate, as Brooke said, you know, the Florida financial aid application, a lot of people refer to it as the Bright Futures application. And I wish we could get rid of that because it is far more than just Bright Futures. It's required for Bright Futures. But again, that Florida financial aid application, there are other grants and scholarships that are connected to that from the state as well. And it is a very brief, easy, quick application. So, you know, not like the, the FAFSA where you have to put in financial aid information. It's primarily demographics. Usually students can get it done in about 10 minutes. So, um, Okay. If a parent applied for the FAFSA previously with another child, do they need a new login for their next child or do they use their existing login? I'll they, go ahead and answer that. Well, they so, can use their... Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> They would use the same no. <laughs> uh, username and password they had. So once a parent, uh, once an individual has created an FSA username and password, that is that person's electronic signature, whether it's for them going back to school or it's for child A or child B. So they would use the same username and password when they're submitting the FAFSA for each child. Okay, thanks. Um, so this one is a, a, a brand And for themselves. If and just in case they decide to complete the FAFSA for themselves, they will use that same FSA ID as well. Correct. So in other words, we're just having one FSA ID for everything. Yep. Okay. So this question um, is, to how does Bright Futures intersect with the FAFSA? So um, the Bright Futures Scholarship Program, it, 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 as I said, requires the Florida Financial Aid application. It, it does not require the FAFSA, so it is not part of that. Um, however, as you know, we've talked tonight, and I, I work a lot with the Bright Futures Scholarship Program as a great program. However, even the highest award is is just tuition and fees. So the way I would say it works together is is you you work on getting your Bright Futures, but then you also complete the FAFSA and other scholarship applications to try to get that whole package to cover your um, housing and and all those other fees that are involved in college. So as, as I said, it's a great program, but it is not. Um, going to cover everything, so we want to to use both of those. But um, that's all I would like to say about that. <laughs> um, okay, this goes back to a parent situation. So, Kaylee, if you want to, um, I think we've probably covered it in a little bit of a way. If parents are separated but not divorced, do we include both parents' info or just the parent our student lives with 100% of the time? Um, when you're completing the FAFSA, um, you would list the primary parent's information and it asks the parent's marital status. That's one of the first questions it asks. And there is a drop down where you can indicate that the parents are separated. It'll then ask for the month and year that the parents became separated. And so in that scenario, you would then list the parent information for uh, the primary parent that the student lived with. However, um, sometimes it can be confusing if that separation occurred, say, in 2019 um, or 2020, and you're now separated, but you had already filed taxes together jointly. Um, just, again, do your best to complete it based upon that uh, the parent you live with, because you did answer they were separated with the month and year, and then you may want to speak to the college for professional judgment so you can supply the documents, W-2s, et cetera, to make sure it's appropriately reflecting just the parent um, who the child lives with. Okay. And um, let me piggyback on that, uh, Kaylee. That particular situation wouldn't necessarily be a professional judgment is if they were separated at the time you know, um, of the application. And like you said, although they did a mayor filing joint tax return 
spike in 2019. All they would have to do is come in to the financial aid office and speak with a financial aid officer. And what we would do at that point in time is get more documentation like W-2s so mm -hmm. we can have a way to split out the income and then just reflect the income of the parent that is the primary. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a need to be considered a professional judgment because if they were separated at the time that you completed the application, it's just a matter of, of us being able to separate the income. Now, if they were together at time of application, then separation took place after the fact, then that would be a professional judgment or change in circumstance. The other thing I want to say is this, and again, um, I'm not being facetious here or joking around. I'm speaking with you because these are actual things that happen since I've been in financial aid, and these are actual cases. When a parent says separate, I just want to make sure everybody understands separation means both parents are living in two physical different addresses, okay? Because we have had students and families say parents are separated because they're in different parts of the home. In other words, they're not sleeping together. One may be on one side of the home and one is living in another side of the home. So please understand, separation means a physical separation, living in two different households at two different addresses. Okay. And, and the FAFSA is actually quite clear on that now. They went in, and so when you're answering that question on marital status, one of the drop-down options um, it lists our parents are separated but living together. Um, so that's a scenario if, if your parents are not married or if they're separated but living together, then you would list both parents' income. Great. Both. Exactly. Okay. We've got a, still a few more questions we weren't going to try to get through. If my son works part-time for my business, do we need to report that income? It was minimal, only tracked hours for IRS, and he was not formally paid. Yes. Whether he's formally paid and receiving a check or whether he's paid under the table or wh however you want to put it, any income that that student or the parent, for that matter, earns or receives, you know, during that year, that would need to be reported on the FAFSA, yes. Great. What should we do after we submit the FAFSA? What other financial aid opportunities are out there? So we've kind of covered that already. With We, we talked about the um, Pinellas Education Foundation, traditional senior scholarship. We've talked about the Florida financial aid application. And again, I would, I would recommend going to um, the PCSB financial aid page, pcsb.org forward slash financial aid. At the top of that page, you're going to find a listing of scholarship opportunities. So these are current scholarship current scholarships that are available. Um, there's also some links on that web page to different scholarship search engines where students can go to like, for example, FastWeb, enter information about themselves and based on that information, they will um, get matched to scholarships. So there's a lot of, a lot of different things out there. Um, to, to look at and with the Florida financial aid application, as I mentioned, if you go to that page, it's going to show you the listing of the um, state scholarship and grant programs. So two other things I would mention in regards to that and make sure everyone understands. When you do the FAFSA, the financial aid award is not going to come from the Department of Education or the FAFSA itself. Um, once you do the FAFSA and you list those schools to receive it, um, the student needs to begin to check that school's um, portal account. So I explain it like uh, students in Pinellas County Schools are used to focus. That's our student uh, portal account. Um, when a student goes to SPC, uh, they log into their Titan account um, or at USF, it's the Oasis account. Um, so uh, students will need to begin to log into their respective accounts, checking their emails, making sure they know how to log into those accounts because it's within those accounts that it's where the student will view their financial aid award. That's when they'll be able to monitor their financial aid status. So that's the next like big uh, jump we need to get. FAFSA has been completed. Now the students need to monitor their status, application status, and financial aid status within each respective college's account. Um, so that's a cumbersome thing. Sit down with your child if they've not started logging into those accounts to make sure their applications are complete and monitoring that. And then the only other resource that I would share um, that district-wide every student has access to, um, your son or daughter can log into Clever and go to Naviance. It's an app within there. Um, Naviance is a really powerful tool. They go to colleges. There's a scholarship um, toolbar there, and it'll show you scholarships that are open right now with their deadlines. So that's another place that I would highly recommend students to look for scholarships um, as well. Great. Okay. 
And to follow up on what Kayla was saying as well, is when you start to log into those accounts, please be sure to check your emails and respond to those emails because that's where they're going to tell you any and everything that you have outstanding, any additional documentation that may be needed. And again, time is always of the essence. Of the essence. First come, first serve. So please be sure to check your emails daily you know, um, to make sure you are responding and getting the documentation that is needed to complete your financial aid file for whatever institution that you are looking to attend. Very good advice. Okay, do you have to list everyone in your household on the FAFSA? You want to. <laughs> so when you answer the FAFSA, the first question, um, it'll ask you about, you know, have the student, it'll ask about other children that live in the home. Um, there's even a question that asks you um, if there's other I forget how it's phrased, but other dependents living in the home are people that your parents are providing more than 50% of their support. So mm -hmm. if you, um, perhaps you have a cousin um, that's living in the home and your parents are helping take care of that child, or maybe you have a grandparent living in the home and your parents um, assume the financial responsibilities and are helping to care for that child, there is a question on the FAFSA where you would want to list that. Um, and it doesn't matter necessarily um, as long as you have documentation, you know, and can demonstrate that they live there, you would want to make sure you list all of them because the number of dependents in the home is factored into your income as well, which can help demonstrate that need further. Yeah, that's what I, when we were talking earlier and there was a question the about the um, maximum income and, and we said that's not the case and it's because of factors like that. So um, next question. And, and do key you point to remember there is. Can you hear me? Yes, Scott. Yeah. Go ahead, Todd. We can hear yeah, you. I say one key point, though, that is, again, that whoever they're listing, they have to be, your parents have to be providing in excess of 50% of the right. support, whether it's grandma, cousin, whomever. They have to provide more than half of the support in order for them to qualify. And if you do list them, that is probably going to be one of the things that um, a school asks you to, you know, to document or, or prove. You can include them, but the key point is you're providing over half the support for them or your parents are providing over half the support for them. Okay. Um, Todd, I'll, I'll have you answer this. Do you list 529 plans as assets? Yes. Okay. That are treated the same as um, any other prepaid yeah, plans, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. um, how does the FAFSA work for students who were adopted and now have a college voucher? Anybody? So I'm assuming that um, if you're saying you have a college voucher, that's reflective of a student that since the age of 13 was in a foster care or ward of the court, and you have a letter indicating that, in that situation, that student would not need to list any parent information. When you are answering the questions about the student, and um, it's under the dependency section, and when you answer that question that since the age of 13, that the student was in foster care or a ward of the court, the moment you answer that question as yes, Yes, it will uh, default so that that student is then an independent for the rest of the application and they would not list adopted parents information on the application. Okay. Yeah, and I do think um, with that voucher, um, those, those students will have um, some resources available to, to help with that process. Um, and if I recall correctly, I'm not sure, I, I believe it is for tuition. So again, there are other other financial needs there. So I, I think that um, covers our questions for this evening. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, Todd and Kaylee, for their assistance tonight, and thank you for those of you who've tuned in. We hope that you found this helpful. Now, I know that this there's a lot of information we've covered, and when you get to ready to complete the FAFSA, you might run into some additional questions um, and that we didn't cover or you don't remember. So as you remember, as you recall, we will have a copy of this um, presentation on the website. But in addition, um, we're going to put up a list of resources where you can get some help. And if you go, um, and there's quite a bit of resources, but if you go, the one place that, so these are all um, places listed, but if you just go to pcsb.org forward slash FAFSA, you will find all of these resources listed. In addition, you're going to find that um, button, that blue button, where you can submit a question or request an appointment. So that is um, 
where I would recommend you, you get your questions in there. Again, you can see that, that blue section in the middle, and you click on that, and um, it will take you to a little um, form that you will fill out. Now, um, I also want to be sure that you um, subscribe and follow our school district social media platform so you're aware of all of our college going program and supports that we have for you and your students at Pinellas County. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening.